line in Australia. And that's interesting to note because Australia is getting into the winter period here very shortly. And so it'll be interesting to see whether or not there is a recurrence, as many people have said is possible, for this SARS-CoV-2 virus to make a reappearance in the wintertime. So we've been doing a lot of updates, and we've been going on now for about a couple of months here on COVID-19, and I thought we would do a review and a quick thing to make it practical. And so the question is, what am I doing for me, and why? And what am I doing for my patients, and why? And as some of you know, I'm a pulmonary and critical care and internist. I'm also a sleep specialist, and I've been seeing patients with COVID-19 now for at least a month. I haven't had any fevers. I haven't had any cough. And I've had a lot of questions out there about what it is that we should be doing. So I thought I'd go over what my regimen is and why I do it and go from there. And I think in the next video, we'll talk about what I'm doing for my patients and why I'm doing that. Okay, let's talk about vitamin C. Just realize that any talk that I give on vitamin C is going to be woefully underwhelming because there is so much good information out there about vitamin C, particularly in lung diseases such as ARDS and septic shock. And we've talked before on MedCram about vitamin C and its use in septic shock. Well, there's a study here that shows that vitamin C can shorten the length of stay in the intensive care unit in general. And this was a meta-analysis that was done back in 2019. There's also a really good summary on Healthline that asks the question, can vitamin C protect you from COVID-19? And of course, we don't have any evidence, particularly for COVID-19 on just about anything at this point, but it does go through the data and it actually has very good resources about vitamin C and effects and what kind of research is out there depending on the endpoint that you're interested in. The bottom line that they come up with They say that there's no proof that oral vitamin C supplements will help treat or prevent COVID-19. Of course, there's plenty of information that shows that IV vitamin C can help, potentially, in septic shock. That was Dr. Merrick's group out of Eastern Virginia. And also there is another study called Citrus Alley, which shows that vitamin C may reduce mortality in patients with ARDS. I say may because mortality was a secondary endpoint in that study. And by convention, they generally don't allow you to claim something that was a secondary endpoint. Nevertheless, do I take vitamin C? Yes. If I can get it in the stores, I take a supplement, but I'll also take a bowl of fresh fruit in the morning, which has lots of vitamin C and is probably more bioavailable. But you can get a lot of vitamin C from supplemental forms. I'll talk in another video coming up about intravenous vitamin C in patients for COVID-19 in the intensive care unit. That's a big topic. We've covered it already for septic shock, but we'll tackle it again. What about vitamin D? Well, there was this paper that was published in 2017, over 11,000 subjects in a meta-analysis of those who were on vitamin D supplementation and asked the question whether or not it could prevent acute respiratory tract infections. And the answer was yes. Here's a list of all the studies that they did the meta-analysis on, and you can see that the majority of these boxes were to the left of this solid blue line running down the middle here at 1, showing you that overall had a statistically significant p-value of 0.001, meaning that there was definitely a benefit taking vitamin D supplementation. But there were a couple of interesting side points to this. What they found was that if you treat 33 people with vitamin D supplementation, you could prevent one acute respiratory tract infection. That sounds like a lot of people, but that's actually not that bad in terms of pharmacology. Generally speaking, treating somebody with aspirin for a myocardial infarction is around the same number. They also found that it was better getting a daily or weekly vitamin D dose rather than a bolus dose when you were sick. And that those with vitamin D deficiency, which let me tell you is not uncommon, the number needed to treat was only four. That is an astoundingly low number needed to treat, which of course means that the effect is very powerful. There was another study that was published from Trinity College Dublin looking at Irish people and whether or not vitamin D could help them. This is brand new data just published a few weeks ago. 
and this is known as the TILDA, or the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging. What they found in this study was that in some people, vitamin D supplementation could reduce the incidence of chest infections by 50%. That's a 5-0. Now, of course, in Ireland, they have a lot of overcast days. I live in sunny Southern California, but I can tell you that a number of patients have vitamin D deficiency, and it's simply because we're inside all of the time. We don't get the benefit of being in the sun. So it really doesn't matter where in the world you are. If you're inside the whole time, you're not going to get enough sun exposure to get vitamin D. So do I take vitamin D supplements? You bet. And I actually take about 2,500 international units a day. That's about 62.5 micrograms a day. You may be wondering what dose is right for you, and it's complex, right? So it depends on your age and a number of other factors. So my recommendation is to talk to your healthcare provider, and you actually may need to be tested and put on supplementation and retested for some of you. I also take quercetin. And I have to say, the reason why I take quercetin is because of the early studies on hydroxychloroquine. Now, hydroxychloroquine, as we've talked about before, has a number of mechanisms that might inhibit the virus SARS-CoV-2 from replicating in the cell. One of those mechanisms is that it changes the pH of the endosomes that are needed for the virus to come into the cell, and that can prevent entry of the virus into the cell. Another mechanism is through a zinc ionophore. Hydroxychloroquine is a zinc ionophore. And as such, when zinc comes into the cell, that can shut down the replicase enzyme that the SARS-CoV-2 virus needs to replicate. Well, as it turns out, quercetin is also a zinc ionophore. Quercetin is found naturally in onions, capers, and other food products. You can get it over the counter. I take about 500 milligrams twice a day. And just as a side note, quercetin is being studied by a Chinese and Canadian researcher in China to see if it makes any difference with respect to COVID-19. Another supplement that I take is N-acetylcysteine, otherwise known as NAC. And this is another over-the-counter medication. And why do I do that? Well, it's because of this 1997 paper titled Attenuation of Influenza-Like Symptomatology and Improvement of Cell-Mediated Immunity with Long-Term N-Acetylcysteine Treatment. Basically, what it showed was when NAC was given 600 milligrams twice daily for six months, while it didn't reduce the chances of getting the influenza virus, it significantly attenuated the severity of the influenza-like illness, especially in elderly and high-risk individuals. And the difference was astounding. 79% of people in the placebo group had symptoms of the influenza virus, whereas only 25% of the virus-infecting subjects under NAC treatment developed a symptomatic form of the virus. And basically, what N-acetylcysteine is doing is it's helping out the liver in terms of reducing glutathione. Reducing is the opposite of oxidizing, so it's an antioxidant, essentially, and it helps the liver in terms of getting rid of toxins. By the way, this is also the same medication that we give in patients who overdose on Tylenol. Again, helping out the liver. So I take 600 milligrams two times a day. Okay, so I also take a zinc supplement. And if you want to know more about why, well, we just talked about the replicase enzyme from SARS-CoV-2, but you could also go back and look at MedCram updates numbers 32 and 34. So I only take about 50 milligrams of zinc during these periods of time where I think I might be exposed to the virus. You have to be careful taking 50 milligrams of zinc a day because that is above the recommended daily dose of 40 milligrams. And there is some concern that taking doses higher than 40 milligrams daily might decrease how much copper the body can absorb. So it's not something I would do on a regular basis. The other thing that I try to do on a regular basis is sleep. Now that may sound crazy, but we actually have good data that sleep is really important. And if you want to know more information about sleep, I encourage you to go to our MedCram updates, numbers 16, 17, and 45. And the dose of sleep that I like to get here is seven to eight hours per night. 
Now I'm going to tell you about my routine when I actually go to work because I see patients with COVID-19 almost on a daily basis. But I'll tell you, the nurses and the respiratory therapists are exposed to those patients far more than I am. And so part of the reason why I'm doing this is to make sure that they are also protected. I don't want to see any of the nurses or the people that I work with get sick with this virus. So the first thing is, let's talk about going to work. And of course, I go to work in my car. And the things that you should have in your car, number one, is you should have a hand sanitizer. You should have a garbage bag. You should have disinfectant wipes. You should also have a surgical mask. Right now in California, we are required to have a mask if we get out of the car and walk around in a public area. And that would mean going into a hospital. So when I get up and go to my car to drive to work, I have two layers of clothes on. And that's usually an undershirt, pants, and then I put over that my scrubs. So I jump in my car and I drive to work. When I'm at work, I typically put on an N95 mask and I cover it with a surgical mask. That N95 mask is mine for the rest of the day. And in some of the hospitals that I work in, they will recycle that mask and give me a new N95 mask or a recycled N95 mask the next day. But what that surgical mask allows me to do is to protect that N95 mask, which is more valuable. And I can take off the surgical mask when I come out of a patient's room because the virus may be airborne and may settle on my surgical mask. And that way I don't have to worry about contaminating my N95 mask. The other thing that you need to do is make sure you follow your protocol, whatever it happens to be at your work in terms of entering and exiting. It's almost a piece of cake putting on the personal protective equipment. What's really difficult is remembering in which order to take it off and making sure that you don't contaminate yourself. And the rule of thumb there, generally speaking, is no matter what you do, you always end it with a hand sanitizer. So generally speaking, what I was doing after I had gone in to see a patient and I would go into the ante room or the room right before you come out is you would take off the shoe covers and then hand sanitize, then take off the cap that is on your head and then hand sanitize. And then you would take off the surgical mask on the N95 mask and then hand sanitize. And then you'd take off your gown and then you would hand sanitize or in some order to that degree before eventually you would come out only with the goggles protecting your eyes and the N95 masks. Then wash your hands with soap thoroughly before touching your face, of course, and try not to touch your face at all. Sometimes we would even use pappers, as they're called, to make sure that you have a positive pressure around your face to make sure that you don't breathe in the virus. And these are especially handy if you're doing procedures that could cause aerosolization of the virus. Then when you're done at the end of the day, it's time to come back home. Some of the staff that I know would sometimes take showers and they would bring an extra change of clothes and they would have showers there at the hospital. I decided not to do that, but instead when I got to my car, I also didn't want to contaminate my car and so because I had another layer of clothing underneath, I would take off the first layer at work. Then I would put that into the garbage bag that was handy in the car. Then I would use hand sanitizer. I would use the wipes on my shoes because you know that there's got to be virus on the ground. So I would wipe my shoes. I would put all of the clothes into a garbage bag. I would put that into the trunk. I would hand sanitize. I would hand sanitize the steering wheel, and at that point, I would then drive home. If you need to get gas, make sure you have an appropriate first layer of clothing so you could actually go into the gas station. Then when you got home, I would make sure to take my shoes off in the garage, as well as just about anything else that I could in the garage. And depending on who you talk to, nurses, doctors, they'll tell you whether or not they're completely stark naked in the garage or got underwear on. Usually those clothes would go into the garbage bag as well, and those clothes would go directly into the washing machine and go on hot. Whereas I would go directly upstairs into the shower before going anywhere else. But it's not just any shower that I would take. It was five minutes of hot, as hot as you could take, and then one minute of really cold, as cold as you could take, and then three minutes of as hot as you could take, 
and then one minute as cold as you can take, and then three minutes as hot as you could take, and then finally ending up with one minute as cold as you can take. And the total there would be 14 minutes of shower. So you're probably wondering, well, why would I do that? Well, if I was gonna be infected with the virus, it would have been here at work. And by the time I get home, we're within 12 hours because each shift is about 12 hours. So if there's any point in time that I wanna have a good immune system, specifically a good innate immune system, that's the time I would have it. What does this have to do with a good immune system? We've talked about this before, especially in MedCrem updates 46 and 47. One of the things that we talked about in update 47 was this thing called the contrast shower, where you do five minutes of hot, one minute cold, three minutes hot, one minute cold, three minutes hot, one minute cold. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Now remember, we have no randomized controlled trials at all with COVID-19. We don't know to the level of evidence that we're normally comfortable with what it is that works with COVID-19. And a lot of the stuff that I'm showing here, I don't have absolute proof that it works. But a lot of the stuff that we're doing here really doesn't have a lot of risk. In an upcoming video, I'm going to show you some of the stuff that we're doing for patients and what I'm doing for patients. And we'll review that data and look at the evidence for it. But in the meantime, I wanted to show you what at least I was doing to protect myself and also my family. Thanks for joining us.